Hey, Dave Politis for the Can Am Missing Project, our YouTube page, copyrighted edition, and we're at a different location today. You can see in the background turquoise water of Ashley Lake, Montana, and uh, it's gorgeous, absolutely crystal clear water. And uh, normally it'd be crystal clear weather, but smoke's blowing in from Oregon and Washington, and it is really hazy. It's horrible. So, anyhow. Here to educate you more on missing 411. A couple of things. We've had 200,000 views in the last seven days on this channel. We've had 12 million views in two and a half years. 8.75 million in the last year. We are approaching 160,000 subscribers with 59 videos. This will be our 60th. So if you're watching this and you think, oh, you know, where's the other videos? They're on the channel. If you look right under the window where you're watching, where it says description of the video, we're going to have all of our links right there to our website, etc. People who don't know, this coming Tuesday, September 15th, I'm going to be on Coast to Coast AM with George, George, Nor uh, George Nori the first two hours. And uh, I'm going to drop a bombshell letter that I got a few months back. Very, very disappointing letter, letter that uh, I hope will wake wake some people up to the facts about what we're up against with our government and uh, I'll put it on our website I'll probably talk about it on the next channel on the next YouTube channel uh, video as well so uh, for this I also want to thank the Rangers and the search and rescue people in the last several months that have sent me emails great people doing great work Several of you have told me that you're going to take training to become a search and rescue person. It's a great way to give back to the community. They need more search and rescue people all over North America. So thank you for doing that. Now, I had some really interesting mail this week. So I'm going to talk to you about a story that I wrote about, wrote about in the Eastern book regarding a little girl that is very similar to the story I told on the last video when we were in Libby, Montana. And in this one, you're going to see the similarities real quick. But first, I'm going to go to the mailbag, and I'll read to you what I got this week. Pretty good. This is a, a guy who was a skeptic at the beginning about my work. And a lot of you have said, well, Dave, we have problems convincing people that this is important, or convincing people that are, are maybe reading other websites that are putting our work down. So this is somebody who's come full circle. Disclaimer, this is the first time I've ever reached out to anyone online or otherwise that I've ever followed or edu educated myself about. Sorry for the novel I'm about to write, but I've been building this in my mind for a long time. It is really late because I wanted to wait for my wife and daughter to be asleep so I could concentrate a bit. I'm exhausted, so please excuse the grammatical errors. First and foremost, I truly admire the efforts you are taking to shed light on the subject. When I delve into something new, I always try to read every aspect of the topic I can from all viewpoints I can dig up. I do this so I can validate the information as words are extremely powerful. You can have two different individuals expressing the same thing in different communication styles about the exact same event, but you can have two completely different views. If you want to form a truly powerful, incredible stance on anything, do not surround yourself with people or look at information which shares the same vision or agenda. Diversify and educate yourself from all resources, in other words. Even if some our info is outlandish, you could still learn something from it. When it comes to Missing 411, if you dig into it, the more skeptical side of the things of your detractors have exponentially less evidence or convincing data for their arguments than you have. No person or organization is perfect, so what I feel the skeptical tend to do is to try to identify a few mistakes or a few data sets they can argue, throw their hands up and say, He's blowing it out of proportion. Just look at this. They will then tend to beat a dead horse until they feel they get their point across. It does not even feel like they will continue their research. It literally feels like they skim through the, your, your information, your personal life, social interactions, business practices, until they feel they can find anything to gain traction to debunk, and then they run with it. To me, I have not found anything nearly as convincing on the other side of things that would want me to fall onto that side of the fence. 
Humans have spun a complete 180. Ancient cultures would attribute something supernatural to every situation they, would, they couldn't explain. Butchering thousands of lives to sacrifice to their gods so the sun would come back. Modern culture feels there's a logical explanation for every event, even when it's truly unexplainable. We are so arrogant regarding how educated by science we are that it is merely accepted to just attribute logical explanation to something mysterious, even though there's absolutely zero or negligible evidence pointing towards that solution. To me, that is sticking your head in the sand and is far more unhealthy than it is to be curious. Missing 411 shares this tragedy with a number of topics, unfortunately. When people like you come along and say, hey, I have a mountain of information here that says something goofy is happening, you are ostracized and attacked for two primary reasons in my opinion. Number one, you are drawing attention to something not easily explained and it makes people really uncomfortable. We do not like the feeling of not having an answer. And boy, I get this all the time. I get people asking me, what's your opinion? What's this? What's that? And I get that from people who have maybe watched the movie, watched a few videos, and think that they have all the answers or think that the answers should be readily, easily available. In reality, folks, I've been at this a long time with a bunch of other people and thousands of people who have read the nine books. Fact, I've never had anybody who have read the nine books say, I know what's happening and here's the explanation. And they're all right out there watching this right now, many of them. So prove me wrong and say, you have the answer? It's not there. And if it was there, you'd be reading on all these sites what the answer is, and you're not reading it. So I'll go on. You refuse to give theories on what is happening as you have not been able to find a good solid answer to it. This also makes people really, really uncomfortable. They crave an answer, and you're the expert in these cases. They have nowhere else to look for an answer that is besides you. So they soak up, soak up the misinformed skeptical theories because those skeptics and logical people have no problem giving answers that they do not truly have. I greatly respect your approach as saying, I don't know, is far more brave than saying, after reading a few of his cases, it's clear the information on the missing is this, this, and this. Boy, so true. We look back in history, shake our heads, and laugh at some of the ridiculous beliefs and theories we've had. We'd love to be able to go into the future and see what they had and shake their heads about it. Will it be politics, religion, our arrogance regarding what we know about physics and the universe? How we teach history classes about our ancestors with a firm confidence even though anything more than a thousand years ago is 95% guessing. <coughs> our lack of being open-minded regarding new ideas, all of the above, maybe even more. The way I see it, even if you are wrong or have not misinterpreted, data 99% of the time, which I know you haven't, that still means that there are 1% of the cases that have truly bizarre explanations we cannot explain. Even if you are 1% correct, you still have brought more attention to the topic than any other human has. Secondly, hell, even if this is all just normal and we have not fit into the normal puzzle piece of the explanation, you're still bringing enormous attention to cases where loved human beings have just vanished. With the respect you show to victims and families and the focus on bringing positive attention to these cases, I cannot see how anyone can actually spin this in a negative light. Not only do you have a mountain of people diving into thousands of cold cases, you have people paying more attention to current cases of missing people. And you know, just in the last month, cases from all over the world, big cases, people have contacted me about them. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked sometimes the spider web of information gets to these people and I sometimes feel bad that I can't help them more I suppose I reinstitute the feeling that it is strange and it's unexplainable and that the factors that occurred to their daughter or their son are in hundreds of other cases as well I can't even I can't even fathom how much pride you must have in the fact that you have done something so positive with your life and I truly would love to feel how you feel when you truly know you have made a significant difference. Lastly, I'm 38 and was born and raised on the side of a mountain in northern Idaho. I've spent more hours tromping around a wilderness, true wilderness, than the vast majority of people in this country. I've only had one truly bizarre occurrence in all my time out there. I feel like the event is a large lesson. I'm more open-minded than skeptical. I have never told the story to anyone, not family, friends, wife, dog, because I'm so afraid of the ridicule and the blanket of opinion. And he did not include the story here. 
One thing I learned in the wilderness and isolation, trust your intuition. Something I've told you many times. When something tells you to leave, leave. Don't push it. When something tells you to sit down, sit down. That intuition we have, I, I've always said, is something that we probably had eons ago and we lost the ability to read it or we lost the ability to clarify in our minds what's happening. But if we really listen to it, I, I wonder how many people's lives may have been saved over time. I've walked into safety earlier than planned many times because of that sixth sense. Sometimes I felt something was just off. These are just a few of the examples I know of, let alone the times changed uh, my behavior to protect myself because of that intuition. The point in telling you this is I feel there's a very different context to your cases when you have experience in the wilderness. I'm not talking about taking a few one mile hikes to a landmark. Truly being part of the outdoors is different and you take the information you put out there differently when you have hours on the outside. Thank you for your efforts. Again, I hope you feel the pride that I have for you. You certainly come across as a very caring and empathetic person and I can only imagine the true horror you observed looking into victims you've investigated. You're a good man, thank you. Cameron. Well, Cameron, I really appreciated that letter and I think that that is good ammunition for the people out there that have friends and family that don't wish to even acknowledge this work and I get it all the time. People don't like reading these days. People don't even like watching. And there's a thing called cognitive dissonance. Look it up. A lot of people have it. And knowing that something is strange in the outdoors uh, and there are people that go to the outdoors all the time, maybe that feels them, makes them feel uncomfortable and they don't even want to know about it. I've had hundreds of responses about Joe Rogan. Why aren't you on the show, this and that? Well, you guys who follow me know why I'm not on it. He won't have me on. And some of the people who watch it all the time have said, you know, Joe's a hunter. And maybe, Dave, if you laid the path as to how many hunters are missing, hundreds, that have never been found in North America and that are truly unexplainable, that may make him uncomfortable the next time he goes into the woods. Or maybe he and his staff watched Missing 411 The Hunted, which is on YouTube Prime, and that made him feel even more uncomfortable and he doesn't want that feeling of enjoyment when he goes to the woods. I get that. And personally, I'd say you gotta get over it because as human beings, you're gonna sit in a room your whole life, you're gonna cut yourself off from information that's factual, I hope not. Another story came from the UK. Mr. Politis, I hope this finds you well. I've been following your research with great interest over the last number of years. I'm currently an academic researcher and lecturer in a well-known Irish university. I hold a BA and double honors in history and anthropology and a PhD in the former discipline. This, as you may guess, means I am very serious when it comes to research and the need to leave no stone unturned when trying to chart and understand any type of event, whether it occurred 500 years ago or during the recent past. I must commend you on the thoroughness of your research and your presentation of facts. Facts, folks, which I must say lacks any over-speculation or set interpretation of what phenomena is occurring in cases you investigate. Thank you for recognizing that. The reason I write relates to a story I was told several weeks ago by a family friend, a gentleman in his 70s whom I refer to as Mr. A. He is an avid hunter and an expert when it comes to birds of prey and falconry. He has spent most of his life working in the outdoors and as a result is very familiar with nature and all of its different quirks. The incident he related to me occurred over two decades ago in a rural area just 10 minutes drive from home. The area in question is located near a ridge that connects to a nearby mountain overlooking the country's most fertile and beautiful valleys. The terrain in question consists mainly of upland, although a very good quality of pasture subdivided by various hedges. There were two large carns and burial mounds atop the mountain and were seen uh, atop the mountain were seen as the abodes of gods and entrances or portals to the other world. The last burning of a woman in Ireland accused of being possessed by a malevolent fairy occurred in 1895, about 15 minutes drive on the opposite side of the ridge from where this incident happened. However, the existence of fairies is not taken seriously today. The mountain is made of limestone at the base, slate, sandstone, scree, and mudstone, while there is a small stream located near the area in question. 
There was woodland located to the west and east, but at several hundred meters distance. This incident occurred about the same time of the year when Mr. A was delivering a consignment of timber to a local farmer, Mr. B. The road access to the farm was difficult. Mr. A asked the owner of the adjoining farm if he could transport his timber across the property. The farmer readily agreed Mr. A delivered his cargo without incident. He remained at the farm for about an hour chatting and drinking tea with Mr. B until dusk, about 8 p.m. He left the home of Mr. B and drove out of the way, out the way he went when he first entered the property. This is where the story becomes a bit strange. Having entered a field belonging to the adjoining farm, Mr. A drove around the perimeter of the field until he came parallel to the gate on the opposite side. However, once he turned his vehicle to exit, Mr. A found that the gate had disappeared and was replaced by a solid hedge. Exiting his vehicle and surveying the area is now quickly diminishing light, Mr. A realized the gate had moved to another corner of the field. He drove around the perimeter until he came to the new location at the gate, but upon turning to exit, he found the gate had moved once again to another part of the field's perimeter. Mr. A believes this occurred repeatedly for about three hours, and he exclaimed to me at one point that it was like he was in another dimension. To me, based on this account, it appears the gate's movements were being intelligently controlled. Now, before you start to think, oh, well, Mr. A, maybe he has early dementia, maybe he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, I've had stories like this told to me dozens of times over the years. Hunters, backpackers, in the middle of nowhere, multiple people this was occurring to at the same time. So, something strange is happening. At about 11 p.m., the farmer, Mr. B, exited his house and noticed Mr. A's headlights circling in the neighboring field. Upon approaching it, and now quite shaken and confused, Mr. A, he was told the story of what was occurring. He was asked by Mr. A to shine a torch at the gateway while he attempted to exit the field. This worked, and Mr. A arrived home about an hour later without incident. Early the next morning, Mr. B contacted Mr. A and told him he should speak with the owner of the field in question as his driving in circles for hours had ripped up the ground. Mr. A did so and recounted the story to the field's owner, following which he received the reply that my father had mentioned something similar occurring many years ago in the same field. Mr. A did not inquire into the phenomena any further until he received a phone call from Mr. B a couple years later. Mr. B, it must be said, was a sheep farmer who had spent many years working alone in this, as a shepherd in Europe's most isolated regions. He was used to working in the dark alone and not easily scared by anything he encountered in that environment. That is, until a few days before he contacted Mr. A. Late one night while he was out checking his sheep on his land, as he passed the gateway onto the aforementioned field, he stopped dead in his tracks after noticing no more than six feet away what he described as a man-sized figure, not human, but not animal. This creature, he said, just stood and stared at him for what he thought was upwards of two minutes. Mr. B was shocked by what he observed too, and too shocked to run and get away. The creature he encountered, which remained silent throughout the incident, had red eyes that steadily grew larger as time passed until it suddenly disappeared into thin air. Mr. B recounted afterwards that whatever it was, he would rather never meet it again. Yeah, me either as he got the distinct feeling that it wasn't friendly or well-intentioned. Mr. A recounted these incidents to me in a very serious, non-joking manner, and I was president on two separate occasions when he told the story to different members of my family. On both occasions, the stories were told the same way, word for word, which led me to believe it was truthful and an account of something he had experienced. What that was, I do not know, nor does he or anybody else. However, the next time I return home, I have to visit with Mr. A and meet Mr. B. Just to let you know, I did send a follow-up email asking for a more complete def definition and description of what he saw in that field with the red eyes. And he said that was exactly what was said. And he asked him for more description. He didn't get it. He's going to see the guy again and hopefully get more info. Now, the last video I uploaded was about Ida Mae Curtis from Libby, Montana from a lumber facility, a uh, logging facility, a logging camp, where during the 4th of July, some parents came to visit. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. It's the one right before this. If you have seen it, here's a story that you're gonna find some parallels with Ida Mae Curtis. The story was in Missing 411 Eastern US, and I'm gonna read it from the book. Katie Flynn, three years old, missing the summer of 1868, Walhalla, Michigan. Henry Flynn ran a lumber camp in the forest just outside of Walhalla. During the summer months, his wife and daughter Katie would come from the city and stay with him. 
Part of Flynn's job was to drive a team of horses carrying the lumber up the hill to the mill, drop the load, and then come back to get additional trees. During June of 1868, Henry would have Katie ride the horse on the way up the hill, and she would then dismount at the top and run back down the hill to an adjacent trail. On one of these trips back down the hill, Katie didn't make it. The mother thought she was with the father. The father thought she was with the mom at the house. When Henry returned to the home at the end of the night, he learned that Katie wasn't there and a search was on. Henry checked the path that Katie was taking and saw her tracks slowly merge with the path of a huge black bear. Sound familiar? As luck would have come Mr. Flynn's way, two hunters wandered into camp and offered to assist with the search for their daughter. The men scoured the area with the aid of torches made of wood shingles. The search for Katie went into the early in the morning the following day and was given up for the night. Early the next morning, Mr. Flynn and a group of searchers went back out looking for Katie. At approximately 4 p.m., the men heard a feeble cry in dense underbrush. The men started to make their way through the brush and toward a river when they heard another faint cry. Just before the men reached the river, the article stated that the men saw a huge black bear jump into the river and disappear across the other side. Katie was found standing on a tree that was lying on the ground and crossing the water flow. The girl was picked up and taken back to camp. Katie had a badly scratched face and hands, but that was about the extent of her injury. So, bear seen, supposedly, water disappears. She's found, scratches on her. When Katie got back to camp, Mrs. Flynn asked her why she didn't run away when she had the opportunity. The story was replicated in the April 24th, 1932 Ludington Daily. Here's Katie's response, quoting, Big dog came up to me, took me in his arms, and walked away with me. End of quote. Noting one of her shoes was missing, the parents asked her where it was. Quoting, the big dog ate it, she replied. Missing clothing, missing shoes. The Katie Flynn story was again printed in July 6th, 1961, Ludington Daily News. In this copy of the story, it had the following as to Katie's rendition of the events. In answers to questions, the child said that after her father had left, she had played a little while on the sand when a big black thing came along and played with her. Then it held out its paw and she caught hold of it and it had walked away with her. Just before dark, it had left her for a while and when it came back, its paw was full of wintergreen berries. Berries come into it again. The bear ate some of the berries and she ate some. Then it scraped up a big pile of leaves close to her and lay down close to her and during the night had tried to cover her body with its body." End of quotes. The quote above needs to be reviewed at two different important points. I believe that Katie was trying to explain that she did not understand what had walked up to her by her first statement, a big black thing. A person's first statement about an event is usually a very revealing and honest representation of a stressful, stressful event. It would appear from the first statement that Katie was having difficulty understanding what she was observing. Katie's explanation about the mammal making a bedding area covering her and keeping her warm is not indicative of bear behavior. Bears are not nurturing warm creatures that cuddle with children. As I have stated multiple times throughout the book, bears play a continual role in the disappearance of people. This story is another example of that of a mammal left and returned with berries for Katie to eat. I don't know what took Katie, but I don't believe it was a bear. Other articles indicate a wolf pack took her also not a possible scenario. A wolf cannot pick berries, place them in a paw, and carry them back in the paw. The story is remarkably similar to an incident that occurred supposedly July 7th, 1868 in Ludington, Michigan, very close in dates and geography to the Wahala incident. The name Henry Flynn is in both articles, so we must think it's the same incident. We are including both renditions of the story. The other story that Katie mimics in the disappearance of the two and a half year old daughter of Miller Davis who lived in Boyceville, New York, on or about May 9, 1888. Davis disappeared and was found 24 hours later and two miles from the residence in a deep rural valley. Davis told her family that she was taken by a big bear and slept with the bear throughout the night. The story is found in the May 15, 1888 edition of the New York Times. Something took Katie against her will. Searchers saw something dark and hairy jump into the river as they approached. Most felt it was a bear, except the victim herself. Bears do not take little girls, coddle them all night, and carry them into their arms. 
Katie Flynn had something very unusual happen to her in the summer of 1868. So, what do you make of all that? So, this story that I just read to you about Katie and Ida Mae, a lot of similarities. And it's not beyond me that both of them happened in logging or lumber camps. I think that's kind of weird. Uh, both stories involved a girl. Both stories involved a girl two to three years old. And both stories involved water. She was, uh, Katie was found essentially on water and Ida Mae had to cross water. And then both stories involve something building something for them to lay in. Strange. Luckily, both girls were okay. In Katie's case, she had some scratches. Ida Mae had no scratches. Now, this area of Michigan, I have found more unusual stories in Michigan. It's probably equal to any other state you can think of for strangeness. And This story here about Katie Flynn probably isn't an isolated event, but it was one that made the newspapers at the time. So, people are gonna all of a sudden start, there's people down the beach, by the way, that's not some strange animal sound. <laughs> uh, people all, all now are gonna say, oh, Dave knows what this is. It's, it's some cryptid, it's some this. <laughs> no, folks. I follow, purposely followed this story up on Ida Mays to show you that that wasn't an isolated incident. But it also is not an overwhelming number of incidents in my books. It's a very small sliver of what's happening. Maybe the next story I'll go a completely different direction and throw you guys completely off. Remember what I said, people who really know the stories understand there isn't one answer to this. And you can't blanketly say, oh, I know it's this, or I know it's that. And when people have the overwhelming urge to say they know it's something, it raises a flashing yellow light to me. So I appreciate you guys watching me every four or five days on this. I'm grateful, seriously grateful for you. And the subscriber base is slowly building. Uh, continue to send this out, this link out via email to your friends. Uh, these are factual events. These are stories straight out of reputable newspapers. And I'm not gonna throw anything at you that I personally don't believe happened. So again, thank you for staying tuned. See you in about five days, 59 videos. This is number 60. Look under the description of the video for all the links to my Twitter and our website. Have a great week.